continuing our series here on light in the Lord and the light of God honoring music. And once you find your place in Ephesians 5, if you will go ahead and stand as we read the word of God together and give him honor in the first reading of his word, the message here. chapter 5, and looking in, uh, back over to verse numbers uh, 7. Be not therefore partakers with them. These are those that try to say you can be carnal and yet be holy. And he says, verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, hold your place there and go a couple pages over to Colossians chapter 3. This is our parallel passage here. Sister passages, if you will. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, and if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for the opportunity we have to be in this place. And we ask you, God, to please help us to, uh, to allow, our, allow our guard to be down uh, as far as what that to guard ourselves from the working of your Holy Spirit and help our ears to be open to the working of your Spirit and the working of your Word in our hearts. Lord, help us to be focused upon you today. Lord, that we might see what your word has to say about some things that, Lord, frankly, get quite kind of personal to us. And Lord, we ask you to please help uh, give grace uh, to me this morning that you'd help me to preach these things in a way that would be honoring and pleasing to you, usable by your spirit, and, 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 and in right alignment with your word. Father, we thank you. We love you. We commit these things to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, please be seated, if you will. Colossians uh, 3 and Ephesians 5. We'll be bouncing back and forth a little bit between these passages this morning. So if you want to get a piece of paper or something and mark these two pieces of Scripture, it would be good to do so because we'll also go to a few other places. But as we began talking about the thought of music the last couple of weeks and began to really lean into this topic, because our goal is what? Our goal is that we are able to discern in our music that we're able to discern whether or not our music is pleasing to the Lord over ourselves, right? We talk about three kinds of music. Now, uh, we have, we see in both passages, three distinct words or phrases that talk about music. So I'm going to the first one. What's the first one mentioned? There we go, Psalms, all right? So Psalms. And Psalms we defined as what the word is there. It's that Salmos. It's a, it's a word of, 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 of it's, a, it's a song, usually with accompaniment, all right? that lifts up and exalts and educates on the person and character of God, right? Who he is and what he's doing. 
The second one is which word or phrase? Hymns. hymns. There we go. So we have the, the, word, the word there is, as far as with hymns is kind of like along the thought of a, a, a token or tithe praise to a deity, warrior, or nation. All right. So what this what a hymn boils down to is basically a testimony of the glory and goodness of God. What God has, his victories in our lives, his, his exploits, the things that God does, we want to give God the adoration and praise for those things, right? One example of, of a hymn that was sung that was not about God necessarily, but more about a man, uh, you had were David and Saul, right? They come back from battle. And the women got out there, and some of the men, and they had uh, tambourines, and they, they were dancing about, and they said, boy, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Uh oh now, Saul was king. So that phrase wasn't received very well in the kingdom that day. Uh, but they were what? They were rejoicing over what? Well, Goliath was destroyed. All these things were being done. They were, they were in rejoicing in the exploits of a warrior, and a hymn falls into that category. It is us uh, lifting up the, the, the operations and goodness of God and how he has worked through our lives. The next one we defined uh, was, the next, was the last phrase there. What is that? Spiritual songs. Right, these are songs that the Bible talks about, these spiritual odes, or rather, as the word translates from. And it's the, literally these things that engage our spirit to communion with the Lord, and that help us to be in right, not, not just a right place with God, but also understanding God in a right doctrine. Alright, so these spiritual songs help us to encourage us and motivate us to faithfulness in the Lord. And so we, we defined all three of these, and we said, you know, Psalms are about God and His character, and instructing us about who God is and His promises. The hymns are the exploits of God and what He's done in our lives. And the spiritual songs are those that engage our spirit to dwell and meditate on the goodness of God, the promises of God, and to take hope in God. And these three types of songs, these three types of music we have that we're commanded to enjoy and implement uh, personally and in the church are there to focus on who? Ourselves or on God? God? On God. And so, biblically speaking, the central focus of all music, particularly religious music, all right, is, is the central God. We need to have our eyes upon the Lord. And so the music should not necessarily be focused on the individual and lifting up the individual. Rather, music is supposed to be focused on the Lord. Now it's interesting. We talked about this last week, and uh, an, ar an article came across my uh, my desk, well, digitally anyway, um, where uh, from a from a, a contemporary Christian magazine, uh, and I can show you the article if you want to see it after church. But uh, people that write contemporary songs are having a hard time because there's more and more of a desire in modern churches today for music that makes you feel good about yourself. Self help songs. I'm loved. I am good. God wants me, like that kind of stuff. And that, that's, that's, the, 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 that's the desire of churches today. Many are they're longing for that. They're asking for artists to write songs like that. And contemporary Christian companies, and, and the article is not against contemporary Christian music, and it's acknowledging the issue. It's saying this is a problem because this is the trend or the trajectory of the music of the day. And so what happens is, and I, I was thinking on that, and I was like, you know, it's interesting. We have made man and what and, and our taste and our cultural norms the defining bar of what's acceptable, and we've not put God in his proper place. And what that done is it's perverted or twisted our philosophies on music. And so in order to combat that, we must think biblically. And so this morning what I'd like to do, and now that we've defined music as far as from the Bible, we've defined what what godly music is defined as from the scriptures. What I'd like to show you are some principles from the word of God that help us to discern whether music is something that would honor the Lord or if it's just pleasing self. You say, why is that important? We'll go back to Ephesians uh, chapter, or actually go over to Galatians, if you will, chapter number five, and look again here. Because these are the operations of, uh, the, the music is to be filled with the word of God promoted through the Spirit of God to encourage us to walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh, as we talked about last week. And so it says here in uh, Galatians 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, 
and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. I want to be really careful when I say this statement, and if it comes across wrong, I apologize. It's going to be, it could be something that I, I just totally did not uh, plot out well, okay? But in verse 16, it makes it quite clear that we are choosing either to walk in the flesh or in what? The spirit. The spirit. Okay. And if I'm walking in the flesh, I'm going to fulfill the lusts of what? The flesh. The flesh. If I'm walking in the spirit, I'm going to avoid fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Okay? Now, we're not, gonna, we're not there yet, but we're about to cross into some territory where I'm going to try to give you some biblical principles to help navigate not just sacred music, but also secular music. You say, why is that? Because not every secular world song is wrong, all right? Uh, you say, well, Pastor Knight, are you saying that it's okay to listen to Eminem and hip-hop? And all? I'm not saying that. But I'm saying... I mean, we sing, the, we, we sing, God bless America, land that, that's an, that's an American patriotic hymn. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sing our, our fight songs for our college teams. Like, there are other songs that are not necessarily God songs, but they're not necessarily sinful either. But the question is, how do I discern whether or not I should be listening to this or not? And you have to have biblical principles engaged in your heart, biblical principles installed that help me think biblically so I can discern, is this helping me or not? All right? And we'll, we'll get there. We're not there yet. Okay? Because first of all, let's, let's tackle the sacred. We've got enough problems there. All right? Uh, let's, go to, let's go to sacred first, and we'll talk there from that perspective. And so, we talked about the types of music as far as how God defines them in their actual genre, if you will. Let's look at some principles that help us discern whether or not the sacred music we are employing is actually pleasing the one we are trying to worship. Principle one this morning, or observation one, uh, we find from God's caution to Israel, God is not interested in the worship that emulates the philosophy or practices of the world. I'll say it again. Principle that we're going to learn about this morning, God is not interested in the worship that emulates the philosophies or practices of the world. Now, I want you, I'd like you with me, if you would, go to Colossians again. And look in Colossians chapter 2. Before I read this, I'm going to kind of backtrack again to last week, just to set a, just to set a precedent, all right? We made the observation... Uh, from Colossians chapter 3, all right? Because Colossians, or Ephesians chapter 5, that, that instruction on psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, that is singing and making melody in your heart, right? So that's personal. That's me employing music in my personal life to lift up the Lord through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But Colossians chapter 3 is an instruction to a corporate use of music. So not only is music important for the individual, but music is also important for the church house. By the way, if you don't think music is important to God, go read Revelation. When we get to heaven, we do a lot of singing, amen? amen. You better tune in the pipes right now. <laughs> this is going to be fun, amen? But the church, now, hold on a minute. Because it says there, and look across the page, because we're already in Colossians. It says in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, go across the page now. We're in chapter 2. Look at verse 2. Paul's talking about a great conflict, a great concern he has for the church in Colossae. He says, my, my concern, my heart for you, he says, that their heart might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now pocket that for a second. He's saying that my desire is that you will be comforted 
the thought there is secure and in unity, being knit together. How? Full assurance of understanding and acknowledgement of the mystery of God. Go, go back to our other text in Colossians 3. Look there. Verse number 15. The preceding verse, that's verse 16, that we talked about letting the word of God dwell in us richly, he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called, and be ye thankful. Now, before you hit Philippi, or before you hit Colossians, there's a little epistle called Philippians. So go back a little bit before Colossians and look at Philippians chapter 4. We want the peace of God to secure us and solidify us. The, the word of God helps us, but music plays a role here. And I'm telling you, many of y'all can give testimony of this. Boy, when your soul is in turmoil, and you're having a rough day, and you put on a good godly song with some good God-honoring words, and it just speaks to your soul, and you're like, man, God's good. It gets your mind off all of that peripheral. It gets your heart focused back on the Lord. Music is powerful. Why? Because music is not external. Music is spiritual. And the minute you grapple that reality, it's going to change the way you look at all music in this world. Music allows communicated thoughts to park and, and interact with your spirit. I'm going to say it again. Music is a vessel that allows thoughts and words to park in your heart and mind and interact with your spirit. So what you let in through the vessel of music does matter. And it matters what it's communicating. Because our goal is what? To honor the Lord. And the peripheral benefit of that is the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received, and heard and seen in me do, look at it, and the God of peace shall be with you. So there is an element to this where the music we use is in the sacred sphere, the music we use to worship God, to praise the Lord, to meditate on his person, will either greatly help us or hurt us in his communication of doctrine and truth in the word of God. What I sing in praise should be biblically accurate. And we made the observation last week. We should hold all Christian music to the same standard of scrutiny that we hold preaching to. And if the song is not biblically sound, it has no place in your heart and mind. You say, well, how do I know it's biblically sound? Because you're in the Bible. Uh-oh. There it is. Lecrae. I mean, you might know his name. He's a kind of a popular Christian rapper today. Lecrae said, I really don't read the Bible much. I just try to commute with the Spirit. Now, wait a minute. How can a man who writes Christian songs that are supposed to be biblically accurate write biblically accurate music if he's not in the Word of God? It's a question. He said, why do you come down on him so hard? I'm, not, I'm just asking a question. He said it. Jesus said, by your words, you'll be judged. Why, 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 and why do Christian artists get a pass? Can I ask you that question this morning? Why do we give people who are Christian artists passes to just say what they want to say, but we don't, we don't give passes to preachers? If I got up here behind the pulpit and preached something off the wall, <laughs> let's, let's, let's reverse rewind. Let's go back over here. Church, I'm going to be honest with you. No, for the recording, huh? This is, this is an illustration, okay? <laughs> so, illustration, all right? Could you imagine if I did this one day? Church, i got to be honest with you. But LT, I'm sorry, man. I'll be honest. 
truth is, I don't really don't read the Word of God. I, uh, I just kind of try to make up, I just try to, try to put some words together that sound religious and make you feel good. And what would y'all do? You'd be, you'd be smart to get out that door. Because you are subverting, you are submitting yourself to the whims of man's opinion. But when you plug in someone's music CD in your car, you do the exact same thing. And more powerfully so, because music is a vessel that parts thoughts and communications in your mind that can move your spirit. Is, is it possible music's more important than we're letting on? Mm -hmm. Isn't the devil crafty? Mm -hmm. Boy, that song got a vibe to it, man. Yeah. Boy, yeah. Mmm, mmm. And I think about that before I think about what's being communicated. And I open myself up to danger. So, what does he say over Colossians 2? Because what we're taught matters, right? Verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, Colossians 2, verse 6, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, and beware lest any man spoil you. That means rob you of your fruit, rob you of your blessings. Rob you of your security in the Lord. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. When man says, I thank, before he says, thus saith the Lord. Vain deceit. Come on now. We've been friends for how long? I'm not going to steer you wrong. Uh-oh. After the tradition of men. Can I help you with this? There are. How many hymns are in this hymnal? 887. 887 hymns are in this hymnal. Be careful now. This, this, this might make you think a little bit. Okay? Which one's more important? Amen. This book should be what everything that's in this book is filtered through. This book is not inspired by God as this book is inspired by God. Can I get an amen? Amen. So when people get behind a pulpit and say, from the hymnal, wait a minute, you're acting like these are the only songs that have been inspired. I'm not against new songs being written, but I am cautioning us we better be careful what kind of songs are being written. Mm -hmm. And then using it in our church. Our music philosophy matters. Mm -hmm. You say, well, Pastor Knight, boy, you're awful strict on that music in our church. Because I'm going to stand before God one day and answer for this stuff. Right. And I, I know we all have our favorite songs. But when you come and say, Pastor, I really want to sing this in church. And I say, I don't know. Pastor, I just, you just hate you. I hate you, okay? I'm trying to be real careful to make sure that everything we do in this church is done in a way that pleases the Lord. Does that mean that my wife will only play piano? No. The Malachi said, I'm going to play piano. Okay, the Malachi said, I'm going to play piano. <laughs> I'm all for people using the gifts God has nurtured in their life to worship Him. But we're going to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I get it wrong, or you get it wrong occasionally, we'll trust the Lord for it. But I'd rather be as close to walking in the Spirit as I can and be away from walking in the flesh and church body. And so he says here, now, so what, what prompted that? Colossians 2 again, all right. Let me close the Bible so y'all pardon me. He says, Beware lest any man spoil you after through philosophy, vain deceit, the tradition of men. In other words, the tradition of men is that man's opinion over uh, it, religious religiously, man's opinion usurps the authority of the Word of God. Okay? And there are a lot of churches like that. Especially those that are very, very ultra conservative churches. Okay? 
there's also the other side of it. Through the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world. Oh. That brings us to this morning. See, what we do is we, we tack, as we talked about last week, we tack Christian on something and we make it holy. And as long as we say it's Christian, then it's right. And that's just simply a lie. But we tell ourselves. We call those things which are evil good because we tack the word Christian on it. All right? That's not right. And, and so we need to be careful that we are not trying to emulate the world. You say, well, boy, that's a pretty weak argument. I don't know that you can just say that from that passage. That's okay, too. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy 12 and verse number 28. Actually, go to verse 26. Deuteronomy 12, 26. This is instructions for the children of Israel that are about to go into the promised land as God's chosen people. Deuteronomy 12, 26. Only thy holy things which thou hast and thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, upon the altar of the Lord thy God. And the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt eat the flesh. Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, forever. When thou dost that which is good and right in the sight of the, of the Lord thy God. So the, the emphasis for the children of Israel is not to go in the promised land to do what they want to do. They are rather to do all things that please who? God. Okay. I'm, hold your place here. Don't leave Deuteronomy. I'm going to reread a verse from our, our core text in Ephesians. Listen. Ephesians 5, verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Pocket that verse. Put in your pocket in your mind. And hold on those words. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto who? The Lord. So the Old Testament, the, the Israelites were told to live in a way and walk in a way that pleases who? In the New Testament, Christians are told to live in a way and walk in a way that pleases who? It hasn't changed, has it? Look what God says to the children of Israel back in Deuteronomy, verse 29, chapter 12. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be, be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from thee, from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Uh oh, wait a minute. God said, When you go in this land, and, I, and, and, and I, you cut these people off, you come in and conquer them, don't go in their homes and say, Hmm, I wonder how they worship their gods. Because I want to do like them to my God. problem here, bringing point A to point B, is when we've tacked on Christian rock, Christian rap, Christian R&B, Christian this, we have taken the rudiments of the world, and we try to take that and say, boy, I really like the way that sounds, I wonder how that, and we brought it into the sacred sphere and said, hmm, I wonder if I can put that in over here. We are taking that which God has delivered us from, the conquer and pulling it into our worship of the Lord. And God says, I'm not interested. Amen. Verse 31. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he hath, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. Boy, 
how interesting that we try to take the rock and roll sphere and bring it into the sphere of, of the sacred when literally the words rock and roll have, a, have an impure, vile meaning. And it has to, and, and everything from rock, the, the entire thesis of rock and roll implies sex. You read it. I'm not talking about Christian elders. I'm saying Valhalla, Valhalen, the leaders, the lead singer of KISS. By the way, what's KISS stand for? You realize it's an acronym, right? They dress up in armor, blackened faces, demonic aperture, knights in Satan's service, K-I-S-S. -S. Oh, it's just music. No, it's not just music. These things are, for, are given in worship to their God, the God of this world. And God delivers us from that, and then we say, ah, oh, I still kind of like that. And we bring it over here. Well, God, I just, I want to worship you. I want to, I want to, well, I really like this. God, it sounds good to me, so. And God says, I'm not interested. I'm just not interested. And even here, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. You say, well, why would God say this? It's not like, they, I mean, these are God's people. Surely, I mean, after God has delivered them from Egypt and led them through the wilderness, surely they would never try to emulate the false gods of the world around them. Go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32 and verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. C catch this verse, the motivation behind it, all right? They say in their words, Moses has been tearing by that mountain an awful long time. Now, can you get the picture for a moment? Moses is on Mount Sinai. And the Bible says very clearly that there are thunders and lightnings and fire swirling around up there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says it's a glorious moment of time. The glory of God resting on the top of this mountain. And it's a holy mountain. They had to stake it off. And God said, don't let your kids, don't let your animals, don't let you cross this threshold lest you die. Moses up there, he's going to come down. He is so enraptured in the glory of God as he's receiving those Ten Commandments. The Bible says his face was glowing with the glory and the presence of God. So much so it freaked children of Israel out, which I think it freaked all of us out. Some guy comes down from the mountain, his face is glowing. I think we would try to, you know, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> they had him covered with the mantle to keep, you know, to keep from freaking everybody out. This is a glorious moment, but he's taking a long time. Bored and discontented. And they told Aaron, hey, I don't know about all this God who brought us this or Moses or what. I tell you what, make us a God. Let's start over again. This is the heartbeat of a lot of the contemporary Christian movement. We're bored with the old, we're bored with the, with what was before. We're not seeing it work today. Let's try a new thing same heart. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to sing new songs. I'm not saying new songs should not be written. The Bible even says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Mm -hmm. But what kind of song we sing matters. Now no. What happens next? Be aboard. They tell Aaron, make us God. So Aaron says, break off the gold earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters. Bring them unto me. And all the people break off the gold earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he made it a, a, a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Wait, wait a minute. 
Verse 4 says he made a molten calf. He says, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And in verse 5, tomorrow is a feast to who? The Lord. Now, well, <laughs> he's talking about like a, like a principality or a king, right? He's talking about like, you know, those that are in leadership on Moses' way. That would be, that would be lowercase L-O-R-D. Because that's, the Lord just means like oversight. Wait a minute. Does your Bible look like my Bible where it says capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D? Well, that, that means he said that's a feast of Jehovah. But Jehovah's not a molten calf. What are we doing? We're ascribing God's name to worldly worship. Verse 7, The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it, have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt, which with, with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, to consume them for the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side, on the other they were written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. So Moses is in the presence of God, seeing the work of God, where the people have corrupt themselves. But notice what Joshua says. Joshua's not with Moses physically. He's a little bit away from Moses, kind of watching the mountain. So Joshua has no idea what God has told Moses. All he sees is Moses coming down, looking a little concerned, with some tablets in his hand. Look at what Joshua says. Verse 17, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. You see, what happened was these people, when they took their eyes off God and tried to emulate the religion of the Egyptians, it immediately perverted their worship practices. And before long, their worship became carnal and sensual. Church, here's the caution from the principle. God is not interested in the worship styles and the rudiments of this world because God knows quite honestly when we bring the rudiments of the world into the church, it corrupts his church's purity. This is why over and over and over again you find in news articles where leaders, uh, worship leaders are having affairs with church secretaries and church pastors and all these things. Why? Because the entire environment around it is carnal. The same thing exists on the other side of the aisle in the ultra conservative, where you have where you have multiple articles about pastors having affairs with their secretaries or affairs with people in their church. Why? Because they are so far over here, where man's word trumps the word of God, that it's still a carnal atmosphere. It just looks different. Mm -hmm. And this side over here castigates that side over here, and this side over here castigates that side over there. And God says, "Y'all both wrong." Bring it back to me. Music is not about what makes you feel good or me feel good. Music is about what pleases God. Amen. 
And if, I, if, if, I'm, if I'm playing music that's supposedly sacred, but I can't differentiate the noise of it from the world, then it is not pleasing to God. You say, well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a hard principle to discern through because how am I supposed to know? Because music is, there's all kinds of music. How can I know? Well, as we come to the secular part, we're going to find out. Music comes from somewhere. It comes from the heart. It comes from the spirit. And so, when we try to emulate the styles of the world, what we're going to do is we're going to fall into the trap of falling into the whims of mankind. And so we must get back to the Bible and let these principles dictate, okay, what should the music sound like? Well, God said singing and making melody in your heart before the Lord. That means the music automatically, the, the, the essential stream of the music should be the melody of the song, not the rhythm of the song. Warlike music is, ri is rhythmatic in nature. It gets the flesh riled up and ready to fight. When I was in, in high school or in middle school, I loved rap music. It made me want to fight, man. Middle school was a tough place. Middle school was a fight every day. So I'd throw in some ludicrous and get on with it. I'd be coming in ready to fight, man. Why? Because it pumped me up for it. Because the rhythm got me moving. R and B is rhythmic in nature. Why? Because it's about it's essential. It's love making music. And then we pull all that over to the to the to the, to the, to the sacred. Can I, can I say it with, with at expense of maybe sounding a little bit crass? I don't want to be okay. So please pardon me if this comes across wrong. But if I can make love to a song I'm worshiping God with, that's some, there's something wrong with that. shouldn't be that the, the music we sing so breathing heavy and wispy and sway in our bodies and voices oh, I just felt the Lord today no, your, your flesh got stirred because the music was, was carnal but your spirit was not engaged in the truth of who God is and in lifting him up in his person. Maybe the reason we don't get moved in our churches anymore like we used to when it comes to singing good music is because we've, we've, we've gotten bored with it. Maybe it's because we're so taken with the secular that we've fallen out of love with the sacred. It's a problem. Like I, I'm, I'm not going to introduce my children to Led Zeppelin and and Ludacris and Eminem and all them. Why? Not because I hate those people and don't want them to be saved. Not because I want to shelter my kids away from cultural influences, and that necessarily so. But because I want to protect their spirit from letting something that's ungodly park in there and interact with them and teach them things that God's word says to run from. And if, I, and if I introduce them to the tone of the music over here in the sacred, I am opening them up to enjoying it in the secular. And I confuse my children and cause them to walk in a way that's not right. See, our choices in music matter. And as a church, uh, and we'll, we'll go one more place we'll close, okay? This is why in the church it's so important. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now, he's given instructions here on the office of a pastor, the office of a deacon. He's going to go into some other instruction. But notice what he says about the church here that should give us some pause. We ought to know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. Why? Because the church is what? Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That means I, have, I don't have the luxury of bringing in a song into our worship 
because it's because it's new, exciting, or popular. I don't have that luxury. Why? Because it must be scrutinized. Why must it be scrutinized? Because the music we sing should emulate or should should declare the truth of God's word clearly because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We're to hold the truth up high so all the world can see it. And our music ought to do the same. Again, we hold preaching to that standard. Why don't we hold the sacred music to that standard? We should. Father, we thank you so much again for the day today. Thank you for the chance we've had to be in this place. God, I pray you'd please help us, God, to go before, from here uh, with peace in our hearts towards you. Lord, I pray that if you've worked in our hearts about any of these areas this morning, that, God, we would take these thoughts with us, meditate on them, and, Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to do a work of purification in our lives that we might be more pleasing to you. Lord, not just that we might just simply obey you, that, Lord, that we might be able to enjoy the, 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 the fruit of that obedience. God, you have a better way for us. You're not trying to take things from us that we enjoy. You're trying to give us new things that not only please you, but also grow within us the things that will really truly give us joy. Lord, the devil lies to us, tells us that we can't have no fun and enjoy nothing as a Christian, and that's just not simply true. Lord, help us to realize that this morning. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us enough to tell us the hard things. Thank you for loving us enough to give us your word to instruct us in those things. And thank you, God, for giving us your Holy Spirit to spur us towards those things by your grace. Lord, we pray that you watch over us and go our separate ways. Uh, be with us and bring us back to it tonight, as you will, Lord, at 6 p.m. We'll record me together again for worship with Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much. We'll see you tonight. God bless you.